Okay, um, before we continue with the um, You only determine that this maybe you can postpone your discussions with the neighbor to after the lecture, and it gives me some room to continue with the lectures. Thank you. Okay, uh, before we continue with that example of the spring added to the system, uh, I want to point out that, um, of course, uh, uh, that the, the lecture notes uh, are uh, a, a living document. Uh, <coughs> sorry for that. But in the end, uh, we're, we're going to get a nice book. Hopefully, so uh, uh, on a week-to-week -week base, you will find new notes there, uh, like here this chapter. And uh, in the errata, I put uh, the errors of uh, which are in the in the, in the book now. Uh, and please uh, don't hesitate if you find some some uh, error or mistake or or unclear thing, uh, write to me. Um, and 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 I put more documents there. Um, the whole concept of virtual work and virtual power in Lagrangian multipliers is actually excellently treated in a book by uh, uh, Cornelius Langsos, uh, Variational Principles of Mechanics. The title uh, uh, seems very um, well, posh and uh, important and so, but the book is really nice. It's, it's, uh, it's almost bedtime stories. <laughs> really. So, where the way he explains the how, how Lagrangian multiplier works is so elegant. Now, uh, and I have a big esteem for Cornelius Langsfors, and there's a nice video, 45 minute video, where he talks about his life and his work as a, as an applied mathematician. Uh, the beauty of YouTube, eh? everything is available. So what what to look for? Well, look for this video because it's really nice. And then finally, there's an, uh, a scientific paper which, yeah, it's a bit of a historic paper on the genesis of the Lagrangian <coughs> multiplier, because I noticed, uh, well, first of all, by myself, but uh, also by you, that um, that the whole concept of Lagrangian multiplier is like magic. I mean, you have something that should be zero, and then what do you do? You multiply it with something, and you add it all up, and then you say, well, now it's zero. And, yeah, come on, it's not zero. What is this? It's, a, it's a, like a big trick, but hopefully, by reading that and doing, there's also a, a nice small example in, in, in my book about, which of course I, I use the whole ideas of lung source, but try to explain why does this Lagrangian multiplier work. Okay, uh, back to where we were. Yeah, sure if I'm, let me check if everything is running. Stop, stop, that is good. Yeah. And then enlarge this. Uh, don't obscure the microphone. Um, so why? How does it come that this that this um, Jacobian of this expression of the elongation transforms the forces? Well, of course it's in the math, you could say, but that's that's not a, a very nice answer, I guess. So, well, let let's let's again look at the problem. So we we have this bar. And we have at this attachment point this Fs. And then how, how does it is transform to these forces? And if I just uh, go through the motion of deriving um, my Jacobian in that configuration, eh, uh, the formulas, put in all the numbers, um, and yeah, formally it's delta L, delta X1, delta L, delta Y1, and delta L, delta phi 1, right? And those number uh, times, oops, that was <laughs> of course, times uh, the spring force, of course. And um, should there be a minus sign? 
I think so, eh? because that's just a sign convention. And then um, what do we see? The numbers we get are 4 over 5, 3 over 5 with a minus sign, and then minus 1 over 10 L times Fs. So apparently, in this case, um, and this comes down to uh, a force, and, and, and pay attention to the minus sign, so a force in this direction of 4 over 5 Fs, a force in this direction of 3 over 5 Fs, and a torque, minus minus is plus, so in this direction of 1 over 10 <coughs> L Fs. So that is what a CSI um, automatically does for us. And actually, of course, you can check that by just uh, going through the motion calculator and putting in the numbers. Um, and actually, you should do that. But you can also go go back to the more to the definition of the whole whole thing, right? And the definition was um, we have a we have a body here with a center of mass, and this body has um, velocities x dot, y dot, and <coughs> phi dot. But attached to that is this point D. And actually what we want to know is, of course, um, and we have this spring here, right? Draw this line. So this is the direction of the spring. So this is it. And the direction of the spring, if I remember well, was something like 1 half, 3 over 2, is it 3 over 2? No, other way around. Ooh. 2 over 3, of course. Um, 2 over 3 L. So if you then, this this uh, triangle then breaks down to the most beautiful triangle in the whole world. And with these. What is the next one with integer numbers? Does anybody know? Yeah, 1, 12, and 13 is also one. But that is a very strange triangle. So 1, 12, and 13 is uh, like this. 1, this is 12, and this is 13. And then this is a... But it's almost like a, a, a an arrow or something like that. This is a 3, 4, 5 is very nice. Okay, uh, so that is the direction of the thing. And if we then can calculate what the speed is, eh, the velocity of point D, and we project that velocity on on that line, then we know what the elongation of the spring is, eh? the elongation rate. So let's do that. So um, the x dot, uh, so this is the horizontal velocity and this is the vertical velocity, x dot of d and the y dot of d. So the x dot of d is, just eh, looking at the picture, that's the, the horizontal velocity of this guy, and, um, well, uh, plus plus nothing, right? Because in this configuration, uh, it only has a horizontal velocity. The vertical velocity of point D, um, well, that is the vertical velocity of the center of mass, plus, and then we have this distance, and the distance was um, 1 sixth, eh? 1 sixth L. So 1 sixth L times phi dot, right? And that is our vertical velocity. And then when we project those velocities on our, our elongation, eh, so this is our elongation, delta L dot, then uh, the delta L dot is, of course, well, the projection of this x dot, so that is x dot times cosine phi 1 and minus y dot times sine phi 1, right? Yeah, we're almost there, so we put the stuff in. x dot was this x dot of the center of mass, uh, the cosine of phi 1, well, we just look at, uh, at our, our triangle, and the cosine is, in this case, uh, the, the bigger one, 4 over 5, so that's 4 over 5. It's the first part, and then minus, and then we get y dot uh, plus 1, 6, L, phi dot times the sine is 3 over 5. So now we have a nice expression for the elongation rate. Now we go back to our definition. Remember, 
So the force in the x-direction times the virtual velocity x plus the force in the y-direction, virtual velocity y plus the force in uh, the torque uh, times the rotation. And then, yeah, it's, it's now a sign convention. Let's say that's equal to the spring force times the delta L dot, right? Or we, we do it a minus sign. Um, actually, uh, we, what we were doing, we were adding it like, I should be more clear. We were adding it with a minus sign. Minus that should be at zero. This, this uh, should be the equilibrium case. Now we have expressed our delta uh, L into this, this x dot, so we can, uh, we can express that part, we can say uh, minus fs times, now what do you get, delta x dot times 4 over 5, uh, minus delta y dot times 3 over 5, and minus uh, delta phi dot times, oops, that's a difficult one, uh, 1 over 10 L. Yeah. And of course, this should hold for arbitrary. Yeah? Delta x dot, delta y dot, and delta phi dot, they should all not be zero for any. <coughs> and the conclusion is then, of course, that the fx e equals uh, 4 over 5 fs, the fy equals minus 3 over 5 fs, and it should be a 5. And uh, the torque should be minus 1 over 10 L times Fs. Okay, just by our virtual work approach. And then if we compare this to our result as given above here, that's exactly what is stated here. So we now have seen in detail how does this Jacobian transform these forces. Okay. So that was for a uh, um, passive element, a spring. Now I like to focus a little bit on an active element. Let's go back to 100%. Uh, and as an active element, I was thinking of this E motor. Um, yeah, so we, we have a motor. And here we have an axle. Um, you, Actually, I should say, I, ha I have here a thing which is called the stator. I don't know if that's good English. This is the rotor. Well, I think that's English, right? And then, of course, we have wires. So there's a box here, and we have wires, and uh, some, well, in this case, alternating current goes in. And on purpose, I write that we have a stator and a rotor, because I, I like to identify the rotation of the stator with uh, phi 1, and of the rotor with phi uh, 2. And, and then again, I'm going to say, oh yeah, it is of course about relative rotation of the two parts, because if there is no relative rotation, it's, it's like a rigid object, the motor is doing nothing. So the, the omega of the motor, eh, the, the rotational speed, is actually phi dot 2 minus phi dot 1, right? rotational speed. So within that, that, that paradigma, within that idea, you can say, oh yeah, this is also an element where there's some sort of deformation going on. Now here we were looking at speed, so let's go up one level, uh, coordinates. So we can define a delta phi being phi 2 minus phi 1, or in other words, we can generalize that again as a, as a C eh, for this motor, uh, which is a function of our xi's, and how does it look? Well, it looks like this. Oh, the dot should go away, sorry. As uh, phi 2 minus <laughs> phi 1. Um, so here, again, like with a passive element, but in active element, that, that is nothing much changes. The, the whole crux is, of course, in the, the characteristic of the, of the machine. So... Here we have, of course, torque eh, coming out, and, and there's a reactive torque here at the stator. And then thinking again, uh, thinking already in angular speeds, uh, if we write the torque speed characteristic of such a machine, then um, actually there are two electric machines I know. The first is a, a DC motor. Now, how does a DC motor work? 
Well, if it's not rotating, uh, you have the highest torque. And, and, and if there's no load, then you have a, a high speed. Yeah? So a line something like this. And if you increase the voltage, uh, the lines go like that. So that is a characteristic. Now, don't operate it too long in this region, because the current will be very high and it will burn. Smoke, burn, hot, melt, thing is gone. Yeah? So uh, also the dynamo on your bike uh, works like this, DC. Uh, then an, uh, a very nice AC engine it's like this, you have a torque and you have an angular speed. And I'm, I'm now looking at asynchronous DC motors. And they have the following characteristic. They have some starting torque, then they have a maximum torque, and then they, they plunge down and around the speed, which we call the synchronous speed. So <laughs> if you just plug it in and there's no load, it will run it, just look at the plate, and it says 1500, eh? like uh, 1500 RPMs is an uh, interesting number, sometimes you see 3000 RPMs, or 750 RPMs, and you already understand where that number comes from, because you have just a, a number of bars in the rotor, eh? and it's a nice, nice number, and you have 50 hertz of electric current uh, running around, 50 hertz, so it should be something here is a multiple of 50, and uh, 50 times the number of bars you have in your rotor, and uh, there you are, you're in business. Um, so no load, it runs at this synchronous speed, but the beauty of the machine is, if you then load it, then the speed does not change so much. Uh, if you put a load on it, then it drops a little bit. If you do the load too much, you come here and I the thing breaks down. And again, if you stay too long here, you get smoke. Right? So those are two types of engines. Now, why am I telling this? Because the whole thing is that the torque is just a function of, well, um, in our case, it's just a function of C dot. Eh? Or, yeah, uh, uh, as we speak here in our terms of omega. Hey, give me what the speed is, and I'll tell you what the torque will be. And, and in our formalism, it's just uh, RC dot. But in, in general, for such a machine, you can say, um, well, we didn't use a general system for, well, let me, do, let me use the, the sigma for, for extra elements. Uh, in general, this, uh, an extra element can be written as there is some, equation where you say it is, for instance, it can be time dependent, eh, like the motor is now not working and now I plug it in, eh, you look at your watch, so it's a function of time, or function of some parameter being like the voltage, right? And of course this CE and this C dot E. Eh, so the, the, in the case of a spring, we have the elongation, and in the case of a motor, it's this, this uh, omega. So this should be the delta L for the spring, and this is the omega of the motor, and this is like the voltage, and uh, this is uh, yeah the switch which you flip on. Oh, it's a ugly switch, switch. Oh, it's, well, whatever. But the basic thing is, give the kinematics, and I'll tell you what the forces are. So everything is always on the right-hand side of the equation. Impacts. Okay, um, assume you have your multi-body system and the thing is nicely moving. And uh, this is the first one and this is the second one. Uh, hinge to the ground, not so nice, but anyway. It's approaching here and you will expect a yeah, an impact here, right? Impact. Um, how would we ca characterize an impact? Uh, 
Yeah. <coughs> That's mathematics, physically. Uh, so you have to explain to your neighbor, huh? uh, not your neighbor, but uh, where you live, uh, what is an impact? Then what do you say? A high amount of force acting for a very short time. Yes, a high force for a very short time. So this is not an impact. This is an impact, right? Okay. High force. Um, oops. Back. <coughs> it is a high force. And a short duration. Duration. Um, to understand how uh, impacts work in our, our multibody system, we first look at a very simple example. And and um, now the other simple, simple example. And a simple example is just two point masses hitting each other. And let's assume uh, we have a, a one point mass, M1, and it has some velocity, V, and there's another point mass, uh, M2, and it has a velocity, <coughs> U, and a V is larger than U. Well, if V is larger than U, then it will catch up and then it will come into contact. So after a while, eh, if this is time, after a while, they will come in contact. And bang, we have our impact. And um, and then after that, let's assume they, they do not glue together. But, um, so there's no glue here. And after that, we have these bodies. And then this will be the velocity after the impact. Now, to denote uh, before and after the impact, and because the duration is pretty short, we are tend to write V minus here, as before the impact, and this is time T, and, eh, and this is T minus, and this we call T plus, and with the plus we mean that's after the impact. So the impact really happens at time T. Okay, well, what happens here? And, and uh, one way to investigate what happens is to make just qualitative uh, plots. So let's let's look at the velocity as a function of time. So this is velocity, and this is time, and then um, and we're going to look uh, from the moment of t minus to t plus, right? Now what happens with the velocity? Uh, it's there's no drag or whatsoever. So uh, v minus the thing is just merrily coming along. Yeah, body one. And body one is going faster than body uh, two, so uh, body two is slower go coming along, u minus. Then at t minus, uh, around that time the impact starts, uh, some indention and uh, uh, reflection, and then it, something like this probably will happen, bang, and uh, this will do uh, something like this. I don't know, just qualitative. So this is u plus, uh, because it should be faster. And this is V plus. Uh, what can we say of the accelerations? Well, what do we just look at, at the graph? So these are the accelerations. And we look at the graph and, um, and we just sketch them. So let's say the acceleration in V dot. Well, at the beginning, V dot is zero, right? Nothing happens. And then it slows down. So uh, negative, negative. And then finally, uh, it was not so nice, it should be something like this. Uh, it comes back again, and here it should be zero again, yeah, because the speed is constant. So this is the V dot. And uh, U dot, well, that's the other way around. That's the one who, get, uh, who gets accelerated. Uh, so U dot is uh, like this or something like that, zero again. This was the plus, and this plus, uh, it's a minus. I mean. Okay, so we now know how things accelerate. Um, 
Now let's look at the two bodies at the moment of impact. Eh? So this is actually the mo uh, yeah. this is actually the moment of impact where they bang together. And let's make a, a free body diagram of this. So free body diagram. We just uh, we, we take our scissors. Uh, oh, it's the other way around. And then we just cut them loose. So we have one body here and the other body here. M1, M2. Remember, this was velocity V. This was velocity U. And then um, we have to introduce a pair of action-reaction forces. Now, according to Newton's third law, these are um, identical eh, but opposite in direction. So there's only one force. Then from these free body diagrams, we can easily write uh, what the equation of motion is. Because uh, for this one, uh, the sum of uh, Newton, <coughs> we apply Newton here. What do we get? A minus F is M1 V dot. And here we get uh, plus F is uh, M2 U dot. Two equations. So looking again at our graph, uh, if these are the accelerations, if we would have multiplied them with the mass, so if we would have multiplied u with m2, so this one with m2, and v with m1, we should have identical graphs. Yeah? Because that is just this force f. And here we have the plus f and the f. So, and now, yeah, that's difficult, so I have to draw this one, and then I have to draw exactly the same one. Oh, I can do that. I copy, and I mirror. Ha, ha, ha. Exactly the same. So this is M2 times U dot, and this is M1 times V dot. Right? Or in other words, these are the, uh, the forces as a function of time. Um, now back to our concept of, I mean, until now there was really not much, yeah. Um, like the moment of impact is in between minus and plus, right? Yeah. And how can there be a force Because an impact works like this. No, T minus is just before they, they, they touch each other. So this is T minus and then uh, T plus. Uh, okay. Yeah? Okay. So they start touching. Yeah. They start yeah. touching and then they, they deform and then they, <laughs> huh? they... There's no other way to generate forces, right? You have, you need deformation, otherwise there's no force. Well, unless there's uh, this magic force, uh, what was it called? Um, um, uh, this, right? <coughs> this is really magic. I mean, there's nothing in between, right? Nothing. <laughs> they attract each other, and there's nothing. How do they do that? Do you know how it works? No, me too. Anybody in the audience who knows how it works? Anybody in the world who knows how it works? No idea. Okay, magic. Uh, back to uh, this magic on a smaller scale. Up until now, the whole concept of impact is not here. This is just Newtonian mechanics, eh? a deformation, eh? a compression, and expansion, and forces. Now, let's bring in the concept of, of impact. So, what do we do? We say this force is going to be very high, and it's going to take a very short time, but such that the product of the two will be finite. Eh? That's the limit case of an impulse type of thing. So, what do we do? We're going to integrate these equations with respect to time. <coughs> and then we're going to take them from t minus to t plus, And we're going to take the limit case where t minus goes to t plus. So really we shrink everything. So um, 
yeah, if you if you want to draw figures for that, then it's something like you start with this, right? And then you say, no, it's like this, and you say, no, it's like this, actually, and then you say, it's like this. Oh, my God, that's not nice. <laughs> One line, that should work, right? It's like this, and then, and then we say, with an arrow, or infinity, or something like that. And that that's, that's the whole concept here. So we just take these equations, uh, uh, integrate them, so we get the integral of minus f dt is the integral of m uh, m1 v dot dt. That's the one equation, and the other one is the integral of f dt is an integral of m2 v dot, and of course from minus to plus, minus to plus, and of course this limit case. Now, if we do that, then um, the the easiest part, well, and, and is of course uh, this this part. That that's easily done because that is just a jump in the velocity. If you take the integral of the v dot with time and you, you just let everything shrink, then the outcome is here simply m one, and that's the velocity after impact minus the velocity before impact. Just a jump in the velocity. And likewise here, we get m2, and we get u plus minus. Now, what about this integral? We have we have no idea about the nature of the force. Yes, some elastic type of force, maybe some dissipation or so on. But we do know, and we stated that the product of the two and the sum of the product should be finite. So just let's give it a name. Let's uh, let's define the integral of f dt is um, uh, is some constant number, and we call that P, just a number. Okay? The impulse, that is the impulse which happens, a finite number, finite number. So here we get minus P, and here we get plus P. Okay, so these are the governing equation of the impulse or written in matrix vector form. Um, what are the unknown quantities? Uh, we don't know the velocity after impact, we don't know the velocity after impact, and we don't know the impulse, right? And then uh, the first equation reads uh, uh, this guy, so that's m1 times v dot, and then, of course, I have to know what the velocity is before impact, and then there's a zero here, and then there's a, a plus, eh? there's a one, yeah. And then the second equation is, of course, um, uh, this guy. So that is zero, that is m2, uh, and then here m2 u minus, plus that, mm. and here what do we have? Uh, a minus one, right? Yeah. Can we solve these equations? Yeah? Because he says you, you can. Well, that's nice. Well, no, these are the unknown quantities, right? These are unknown. So we have two equations and three unknown. And we call that uh, usually a Cole Porter problem. Uh, because anything goes, right? Well, it's not true that anything goes. In olden days of silk and stocking, showing a leg was shocking, oh, have knows. Anything goes. Yeah, Cole Porter problem. Um, it's not anything goes, but you have an infinite number of solutions here. So we need extra information. <coughs> what extra, what information are we missing? That's already there. Maybe there's energy lost during the impact. I'm I'm looking at the general case of uh, of impact. So, 
which momentum. Indeed, if I add up these two equations, I have momentum conservation. It's already in the equations. Add this with this and you get m1 v plus plus m2 v plus equals m1 v minus. Well, actually, in the old days, that was also the problem. They had no idea. But uh, there was one guy who was sort of smart. Uh, and his name was, no, not this one, sorry. His name was Newton. And uh, what did Newton do? He studied uh, the other course. Yeah. Yeah, this here, lecture four, pages from Newton. And Newton, he studied mechanics, right? Um, so this is from his book, a translation of his book, actually. Uh, so it shows those three laws. Eh? Uh, everybody is at rest, and there's no force, and will keep on moving. And uh, and and if you want to move a body, then you have to apply a force in ratio to a thing called mass. And this, the last one is funny. To every action, there's always opposed uh, uh, an equal reaction. Eh? Anyway, um, then you start reading. Uh, call corollary things and so on and ah, nice pictures that always attracts my attention so then I'm, I'm gonna read hey what is he doing there I have no clue actually and then there is a part where he suddenly starts talking about ah aha this one triggered my mind because in this I recognized actually what what we are doing with our, our impact of our two point masses and um, for Newton, it was very difficult to measure, but he found a very elegant way to measure. And that was by using penduli. Um, the height by which a pendulum comes back is the amount of yeah, living force which is in the object. So he, he could see what the effect was of different masses and different materials. How much do they reflect? But the most, most yeah, I also show this because um, it's, He's such a scholar, Isaac Newton. He does what we all should do. And he, he first reads the literature. So he gives praise to his colleagues. Eh? Uh, here, here you see, um, he, he discusses then uh, again about the impacts and things. And by the same, together with the third law, Sir Christopher Wren, Dr. Wallens, and Mr. Huygens, and mind you, it comes, the greatest geometer of our times. Now, this last sense we, d we tend not to do nowadays in papers. When we write a paper, we give reference to somebody and we do not say that he is super smart or, or, or very ugly. or <laughs> We don't do that. <laughs> but isn't it elegant? Isn't it cool that he does? So he's, he's a great gay guy. So, uh, did several determine the rules of congression and reflection of hard bodies? So exactly, uh, this impact problem. So. Uh, uh, by this he states, I'm not alone in working this, a lot of more people have worked on this. And actually here, the, the major uh, reference is Mario, a Frenchman, he was one of the f among one of the first. Well, and then he goes into a, a, a very lengthy geometrical reasoning about how he measures this and determines that. And, but what we are seeking is, we are seeking a law. Eh? What is the law by which, which the, the things work? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. So, um, so then he, he says here, thus trying the thing with pendula of 10 feet is unequal with equal bodies and then descend like so many and come back like that. And it's, it's complex. He's saying, uh, what is he getting at? Um, and then he, uh, this I tried with bulls of wool made of tightly and compressed. And so he did a lot of balls of steel and. But then uh, finally is a part, uh, where, where am I? Uh, yeah, here. There finally is a part where he says, yeah, here, I have to look for it. Different, uh, yeah. Where does oh the sentence really begins? Oh yeah, it's a long set sentence. And makes the bodies to return one from the other with a relative velocity which is in a given ratio to that relative velocity 
uh, with which they met. So he says, with all the experiments I did, I discovered that for a certain material, and of course balls of wool, uh, balls of wool and balls of steel uh, <coughs> behave differently, but within these balls of steel, I, I saw that every time the relative velocity before impact was in a given ratio to the relative velocity after impact. And that is what I discovered about these impacts. Moreover, he also writes further on that this, by this experiment, I also proved my third law. Uh, this whole concept of action equals reaction, uh, with a minus sign. Because that, that is the basic thing we are also using. Anyway, uh, it's on the website. Uh, for those who would enjoy, please read it. Uh, let's get back to our problem. So. The law we're going to add here is the following. So Newton's impact law tells us Newton's impact law that the relative velocity uh, before <coughs> impact divided by the relative velocity after impact is at some given ratio. Um, why do I say minus e? Because, well, when, when you go from left to right after collision, you go from right to left. So there's always a sign reversal. And E is like a material constant. Now you can rewrite this. And you can say, oh yeah, so the relative velocity after impact is uh, minus E. Eh? Because Newton was always talking about ratios, but we like to talk in equations. Big difference. Um, so we say, well, uh, relative velocity after impact minus E times the relative velocity before impact. So if the E, the material constant, is probably something between 0 and 1. Because bear with me, if you have a thing like silly putty or something like that, then the impact is like plop, <coughs> and it sticks to the... So meaning the relative velocity after impact is 0. Whatever the relative velocity before impact was, it's zero. So that's the E is zero, so that is a fully plastic one. The other one, the E is one, is that by which you uh, bump into each other, you also <coughs> depart. Eh? The relative velocity out is the same as before, <coughs> meaning this is fully elastic. In our terms, for our problem, if we apply that, what is the relative velocity before impact? Well, let's say that is a, let's take a positive number, right? So V plus minus U plus, eh? V was approaching, is minus E times V minus minus U minus. So that is the equation we were missing. And we can add that equation, of course, to our set. And, oh, I love this. Mm. I'll copy yeah, and I'll put it aside somewhere. That's good. Uh, pick it up again. Oh, where are you? Uh, I'll put it here. Okay, enlarge. Yeah. So now we're going to add this last equation. And yeah, an extra row. And the last equation tells us, well, a uh, v plus, so that's a 1, a minus 1, and a 0. And then on the right-hand side, we get, well, minus e, v minus, minus u minus. Which we can solve, right? So, given m1, m2, uh, v minus, and u minus, and e, huh? this number, this magic number. Isn't that equation beautiful? Do you recognize it? 
because I think that is in essence what beauty is. Beauty is a form of recognition. Hey, wow. So what do we see? Yeah, please speak up. What do you see? Yeah. Exactly. We see exactly that. We see an M, a mass matrix. We see a, a matrix here. Well, let's call this A, and then we see A transpose here, and we see zeros. And and also the. Oh, and the unknowns, of course. Yeah, but but I mean the whole structure of the equation, and. Um, uh, Time-wise, the, the, well, there's no time now. I talk too much about Newton and so on. But um, you can imagine what we did for this small problem. You just take the, the, your virtual power equations, your equation of motion. You put an integral sign in front of it and a dt. You just integrate it with time. You pull out all the terms, and you get exactly this set of equations with all the, the, the to us, familiar symbols. And... Let me get. Let me show what the result is. So uh, read, read, uh, read the book. I say, and then finally the result will be something like this. You have an Mij. You have some mass matrix. Then you have, of course, some constraints. Uh, C K I. Then, of course, we have these velocities. Uh, we're now talking about velocities, and these are the velocities after impact uh, with the plus, and it should be a J. And then we have multipliers lambda K. And then on the right hand side, we have, yeah, we have sort of applied impulses, which I will call SI, and that is something which you can do uh, with a hammer, for instance, right? We, we don't do that very often. We don't have a, a, from an external impulse to a system. Well, you can do it, but um, it, it's usually it's, it's zero. But then also we have the other term, eh? um, uh, the, the plus MIJ x dot minus j, eh? that's, that's the momentum before impact. And then of course here we have the uh, constraints together with the, uh, uh, there are regular constraints in the system, together with the impulsive constraints where the, the impulsive motion then happens, but we can generalize everything and, and throw everything on one big pile and say those are CKI x dot minus, or well, let's call it the j. So term by term, this is mass times velocity. So this is momentum after impact. This is mass times velocity, that's momentum before impact. This is externally applied things, which almost never happened. Uh, bang. Okay. So when you want to hit a nail, for instance, but for the rest. Um, but you could also model this, of course, here, uh, as part of your system. It's, it's all depends on the system boundary. I'm finishing up, and then I'll come to you. Um, this is, of course, a Jacobian of constraints and expressions of contact, and likewise here. These guys, this is a whole collection of joint impulses and impulse where the contact is. So that's all piled up in one long vector. So part of it is joint constraints, and, and one or two of them are impacts. Um, having simultaneous impacts in a system is, is a very difficult, so usually there's only one impact. And then on the right-hand side, well, for the constraints, this always has to be zero. Eh? And, and, and so you can do also minus e times zero. That also works. And then the last one, last equation, or the last few equations, were really about this impact condition. Uh, only at the moment of impact, they show this Newtonian law. But I can generalize it by writing for everything. And that finalizes our impact equations. And there was a question from the audience. When we define relative velocities, we are defining it with, with respect to which body? The second one or the first order doesn't matter? Uh, it doesn't matter how you define it, as long as you're consistent. So if you say one, uh, one with respect to two or two with respect to one, that doesn't matter. You will see. Yeah? Okay, see you all next week. Ja, dan moet nog een J. Die moet een J zijn. Dank je wel.